Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to the WTO Public Policy Forum and this session that's organized by the International Trade Center as part of their annual Trade for Sustainable Development event. My name is Tyler Gillard. I'm the head of due diligence at the OECD's Responsible Business Hello. Conduct Center, and it's my pleasure to moderate this high level panel on collective action and sustainability standards. And it's even more so my pleasure because it's in fact my first in-person uh, panel that I've been to in over 19 months. I had to dust off my suit to, to come in here. Um, I guess you're all pleased I'm not wearing my sweatpants. Um, and I also do want to welcome those of you that are joining us online who aren't able to make it to in unmute. person. Um, and I encourage you, if you're joining us online, to please use the Q&A, the questions and comment, uh, to send in your questions and comments throughout the event and uh, the session. I'll definitely try to, to get into that and uh, redirect them to our panelists. panelists are so sustainability needed. standards, um, just ask them to what are they and where are we now? You know, we know that the aim of sustainability standards and, and code of conduct and sustainability certification initiatives is really to improve okay. if you the environmental and social performance in specific global supply chains. <laughs> this originally was, in, in a way, 20, 30 years them, ago, uh, a kind of a neat yeah. area that was driven by civil society and consumers and very specific consumer-facing products. And now I would say sustainability has moved beyond the niche into the new normal. Um, we see that so there's initiatives of all shapes and forms that audit factories, that certify goods and services, that train and build uh, the capacity of suppliers and global supply chains. And if we look at the arc in the development of sustainability standards, we see sort of three phases in my view. The first phase was really in the, the testing and the experimentation phase driven by really a demand by consumers to develop these standards. The second phase was sort of let a thousand flowers bloom. Let's put, push these out these into the market. And we saw a huge and exponential growth in sustainability standards in all shapes and forms covering almost every single supply chain. Now I think we're in a critical phase though of self-reflection where sustainability standards, governance, governments and civil society need to really think about the added value of these standards and how they fit into public policy priorities. I think what's driving this self-reflection is the COVID-19 crisis, which exposed, of course, major vulnerabilities in global supply chains, often linked to uh, social, social issues, but obviously also our climate crisis. We really see that we're in a kind of a new paradigm, and that forces us to look at are sustainability standards delivering in their promise? Are they having the impact that they set out to achieve? When answering that question, I think you see kind of a mixed results. You see that sustainability standards have created, uh, sort of galvanized a lot of business action and collective action, but we also see limited impact on the ground. We see a lot of challenges related to cost uh, for small producers to access global markets and comply with sustainability standards. We see some fatigue, particularly with overlapping and fragmented universe. There's a whole alphabet soup of certification programs. I'm learning about new ones every day and I'm still, I'm supposed to be a specialist here. There's a fatigue of some suppliers about audits and going through the same audits over um, on the same issues, sometimes 12 to 15 times per year. And I think more broadly, we're seeing government, governments shift their policy they're redefining what the role of business is. And that includes, at my organization, at the OECD, we set global standards of responsible business conduct that uniform standards in environment and human rights and labor and corruption into one framework and recommend that businesses conduct due diligence utilizing sustainability standards to make sure that their supply chains are responsible. What does that mean? That they make efforts to mitigate or minimize the environmental and social harms of their supply chains while maximizing the positive impact of their products and their supply chains on sustainable development. So it's within this universe of self-reflection that this session is taking place. And I think the objective of the session today is to really understand the state of play with sustainability standards and certification initiatives. How have they helped the market? 
how have they helped producers, but what are the challenges ahead? And particularly, what is the role of policymakers that are designing trade policy, but not only? And I do want to note that sustainability by definition cuts across all areas of government policy. Last week, I was speaking on an event on competition law and sustainability. So there's almost every single area of government policy uh, touches on this topic. And when we think about collective action, we're thinking about collective action between sustainability standards. But we're also thinking about collective action within a government to design a policy that accommodates for, for the use of these standards that are on the market and how they need to really be improved to be after the self-reflection exercise. I'm really pleased with our stellar and high level panel that we have lined up for you today. Um, we're pleased to welcome Ms. Pamela Koch Hamilton, who's the Executive Director of the International Trade Center. We also have Mr. Jean-Marie Hogam, who's the Deputy Director of the WTO here uh, in Switzerland. We have Dr. Afwa Asare, who's the Chief Executive Officer of the Ghanaian Export Promotion Authority. And finally, last but not least, we have Ms. Janet Mensink, who's the Executive Director of the Social and Labor Convergence Project uh, in the Netherlands. With that welcome, I think we should dive in and uh, get right into the meat of, of the issues since we only have an hour. And I'm gonna start with you, uh, Pamela, if I may, um, to sort of walk us through your perspective on sustainability standards, and in particular in relation to the development of small businesses, um, and what is the role of organizations like ITC in addressing some of those real persistent challenges of SMEs accessing markets. So over to you. Thanks so much, Tyler. And I appreciate um, the fact that you're here in person and actually wearing clothes. And um, <laughs> you're actually lucky that they fit. Uh, that's a, a different problem that many of us have been having. At any rate, uh, thank you so much. It's great to be on this panel. Um, I think, first of all, we need to start with SME development. You know, one of the things that we've seen is that SMEs are probably the most crucial actors who will help to um, support and fulfill the objectives of the SDGs. Why? Because SMEs account for 50% of all greenhouse gas emissions, as well as employment. And therefore, it is going to be critical for us to work at that level if we really want to have um, sustainability and sustainable development um, in real terms. The other very important issue is that voluntary sustainability standards are one of the key tools that we have in our, in our arsenal to actually work with SMEs to help them develop, to uptake and, and, and ensure that they're able to access markets in certain products and services. So we've actually seen that VSS, or sorry, Voluntary Sustainability Standards, and I'll use VSS from now on, because I realize that Geneva is very into acronyms. So, <laughs> so I think everybody gets what VSS is. But VSS have also been, been positively impacting, particularly in the context of, of the pandemic. One, we found that um, the VSS can improve uh, the smallholders' resilience to external shocks. So because it provides um, a kind of niche marketing approach. They get higher premiums in, in many cases uh, for their goods. Um, they're also able to form stronger relationships with their buyers because the buyers are vested in ensuring that they provide sustainable goods. Um, the other thing is they're able to secure better markets and also have more options in terms of selling their products. Um, and of course, they experience faster recovery uh, because in, the, in terms of a disruption because they have such strong linkages across the board. Um, essentially, we've been in the field now for 10 years. Um, congratulations, Joe. And um, our work with SMEs from Coco in Gambia to Quinoa in, in, in Peru and garment suppliers in India has shown that VSS and the sustainability mechanisms have supported a couple of things. One, for them to internationalize. That's really important. Secondly, their increased access to, to new markets. Um, thirdly, it's improved the worker experience. And, and finally, it also has been in good for the environment. Now, we are, as far as I'm concerned, the broader issue, and we were discussing it earlier in, 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 the, in the, what do we call it? The welcome room. <laughs> um, uh, I think we had to get used to each other being clothed again and seeing what we look like outside of Zoom. But, 
the, the thing with VSS is that it, it meets what I call the troika um, of, of issues. One, meeting the issue of uh, economic resilience. Secondly, looking at the issue of environmental sustainability. And thirdly, looking at the issue of empowerment. How do how, the three E's I call it, but these things are, are really important because as a trade practitioner myself, I know how critical standards can be and voluntary sustainability standards have become more embedded. So three of the main findings from our report, I guess I'm supposed to hold this up. This is why you put it here. Nobody else got one. So I'm assuming that this is the propaganda that I'm supposed to now hold up and say, you know, this is the, but the three, three main findings from the report and then I'll finish. First is that there's been a really um, stark increase in the voluntary sustainability standards uh, over the last few years. Um, and we now have over 300, right, on our standards map and we're celebrating 10 years of that. Secondly, you know, the, the VSSs are adapting to fit the consumers and producers um, and, and also brands. And so what we're seeing is also a consolidation of, of standard requirements um, and also improved approaches in terms of ensuring the impact on upstream producer level and so on. And then finally, um, you would also assume, and many people do, that voluntary sustainability standards are private. What we've seen is more and more VSS are embedded in free trade agreements in, in policy. So it's now being adopted as, as actually a more cross-cutting issue as you alluded to, um, and that therefore increases its importance. So I'll stop there, thanks so much. Thanks Pamela for those uh, great reflections to, to get us going um, about the good upside, about you know the support to SMEs uh, to access markets and obviously ideally improve livelihoods. Uh, and empower workers and empower entrepreneurs and global supply chains. Uh, and some of those developments, you know, the increase um, in, the, in the number of them, but also how they're adapting. And I, and I think as we also noted, government policy is adapting and, you know, we can call them voluntary, but maybe they're no longer voluntary anymore. Um, whether it's a market de facto requirement or it's becoming an actual legal requirement ensh enshrined in law. We know that the EU is currently considering new mandatory uh, legislation on due diligence and global supply chains. Um, and I think what is good practice on sustainability has evolved a lot over the last 20 years. So sustainability standards are also confronted with embedding what is the best practice, learning from where their weaknesses are to improve and align with global benchmarks uh, and address some of those weaknesses. Next, I'm going to turn to you, uh, Jean-Marie. Um, obviously, in your career uh, in trade, both in the French government and at ITC and now at the WTO, you've seen the growth of these standards. Um, you've seen you know, lots of discussions and, and trade agreements on sustainability chapters and other uh, kinds of mechanisms. What do you see as the role of the WTO specifically, particularly at this important moment in time uh, in promoting the uptake of sustainability? And how does this relate to the, 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 the way that small entrepreneurs can integrate into sort of global value chains. Thank you, Stella, Taylor. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me please uh, start by commending ITC for this panel on this very important question for the reasons that Pamela has so well, so eloquently exposed, uh, and especially the impact on SMEs. Uh, I'm also personally a great fan of uh, standard maps because I have had the light in ITC and I, I knew the project in its early infancy. Uh, Joe was uh, and myself were young and handsome. Uh, now Joe is still young and handsome, but the projects have gone uh, a little bit uh, bigger. So um, to try to answer your question, and I'm going to develop that, I think my key point is that the importance of standard maps is that it provides a concrete response to what is really a blind spot in our governance system on, uh, on trade. And let me uh, try to describe how the WTO looks. Uh, WTO system looks at uh, private sustainability standard just by picking up each one of the world. Sustainability, green light, it's okay. Uh, it's not only uh, something that we recognize, it's something which is part of our statutory mandate. In the Marrakesh Agreement, we recognize that uh, the WTO is there to negotiate, to facilitate the negotiation of trade agreements including uh, <clears throat> with, with, with the objective of sustainable uh, development. There are other objectives, which are Keynesian in a sense, like 
uh, full full employment, uh, welfare, etc. So sustainability, green light, uh, and uh, it's uh, it's no, no surprise that the WTO being the anchor, uh, also bilateral agreements would pick up this issue in uh, in their provisions and more and more. And we have uh, accounted uh, like uh, more than 270 uh, bilateral agreements in the world, which include uh, sustainability provision uh, in them. So that works. Second element is about uh, standards. The WTO recognizes standards uh, absolutely clearly, uh, fully, uh, including on uh, labor and environment or social and environment uh, standards. This is uh, extremely clear in two of our agreements, which are pretty technical. Was in, is, one is called Technical Barriers to Trade, TBT, acronym, uh, and the other one, sanitary and phytosanitary measures, uh, the <clears throat> second one being, of course, for um, environmental, uh, for, for agricultural products. Uh, both the agreement recognize the legitimacy of those standards. That's the first element. The second element is that all the WTO system refers to international standard setting organization as the anchor for uh, public policy making in, in terms of standards. In, in other words, our job usually is to try to find if there is any discrimination in standards. But if your standard nationally relies on an international standards, then mostly it's fine, unless you have been so smart that you have detected the discrimination in, in uh, somewhere there. So standards is not a problem. Green light again uh, here. Now we come to the uh, private standard and uh, he, um, I might say that we come into, from a WTO perspective, into outer space, and I'm going to describe that uh, with two elements. The first one is that um, a private standard uh, for the WTO is a, an unflying object, a UFO. Uh, the WTO does not have a role, uh, a mandatory role, a statutory role in that field, because um, we are an intergovernmental in, uh, organization and we do not uh, we do we recognize public standards. We do not really recognize uh, private uh, standards. And the second thing is that private standards are an alien uh, because we have been trying to define that uh, for years. Actually, there have been more than ten years of work uh, inside the WTO on this um, on this uh, topic. Uh, it started back in two thousand five uh, when Saint Vincent and the Grenadines. So you can see that. The perspective is already where, where it's coming. Uh, St. Vincent and Grenadine came to the WTO to voice their concern about the growing number of private standards um, for the banana industry. Everything starts with the banana industry in the WTO. When something is important, you're sure you find banana somewhere. Um, and they said it poses a challenge for small farmers and small vulnerable economies, which uh, relates to the point that Patricia uh, made. And they argued that uh, there was, I quote, confusion, inequity, and lack of transparency, uh, which were often coming with those uh, standards. So the debate started within the WTO, uh, especially uh, within our sanitary and phytosanitary, phytosanitary committee. But uh, the discussion was eventually dropped uh, in 2015 because of the impossibility to really define what a private, a private standard was. Now, we played uh, non-guilty because other organizations have also failed to define what a private standard was. So that's why I'm referring to it as a, a, an, ali an alien. Why is it a problem? Uh, if you allow me to continue with science fiction, um, maybe bef before uh, Joe was even born, there was a movie from John Carpenter. I don't know if you know John Carpenter, but the movie was called They Live. And the movie was about um, aliens, which were capitalists ruling the world, but you could only see with uh, some black lenses, uh, which, make, uh, which make them appear. So Standard Maps is uh, about that. So the lenses which show you where the, 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 the rule, uh, which is so important for, him, from, for SMEs, uh, is uh, coming from. And is obviously a, a, a very complex issue for uh, SMEs all around the world. That's why transparency, and I was saying that at the beginning, it's a blind spot. Transparency is the only concrete solution that we have found so far. Congratulations again. Can we do something more, which was a little bit what you were expecting from me? Um, yes, we can do uh, guidance. Our TBT committee has suggested some guidelines about how to set standards. 
this is not mandatory, but it, the principle apply to public standards as well as to private standard. Uh, we can do, uh, we can refer uh, the markets to international setting organization, which is a way to move from private standard to uh, recognized standard inside the WTO. And of course we can do technical assistance to help um, SMEs um, rise up to the level uh, beyond transparency. For instance, we have a, a we contribute to a fund which is a, called STDF, about phytosanitary standards, where we help uh, SMEs. So this is what we, we do. Uh, last but not least, I, I would like to, to, to share a personal takeaway on this issue, uh, which may be inspiring to some negotiators, to some negotiations, maybe happening somewhere inside this organization, maybe now, is that you always have an alternative to the WTO. If you do not get an agreement in the WTO, then you have other forces which are going to shape the trade world. These forces can be bilateral or they can be the private sector. So failing in the WTO is not an option. We need to succeed when we want disciplines on international trade. Thank you very much. Thank you for those reflections. And um, as we can see, we're, we've started by talking about our garments and we've gone into science fiction. So multiple layers uh, to this discussion, uh, clearly. But I think what you, you highlight a number of things, and, and, and if, I, if I may speak with my OECD hat on as well, I would say that, you know, we do see that there is a difference between, you know, publicly backed, government backed standards that are developed by international standard setting organization and private standards. And there's an interplay there. And I think the role of all of us is to strengthen that interplay because it's the private standards where the implementation is happening. But there's still a lot of challenges there. They're not necessarily comparable. They don't necessarily recognize and speak to each other. They create economic challenges for producers, as we know, to access markets. So the OECD perspective, we're all about alignment. We're all about pushing these private standards and multi-stakeholder initiatives to align with the global benchmarks that are developed by governments um, to reflect the best practice. Through that alignment, we help to create a level playing field and eventually, hopefully, some better what we call mutual recognition between the standards where, you know, even if they're not exactly the same, they say, well, I will accept an audit if that's aligned with international benchmarks, regardless of if it's this specific program or this specific program or this specific program to help alleviate some of that duplication and fatigue in the supply chain. And there's roles, I think, um, for international organizations, the WTO, the UN, the ILO, the OECD, others to help support that connecting tissue between public and private standards, where we do see a hierarchy of norms. You know, uh, you know, public standards are developed with governments and endorsed through an inclusive process. Um, but there's also that interplay within ministries within government that I think that need that hopefully organizations like ours can can help connect. With that, I'd love to turn to uh, Dr. Afwa Asare. Afwa, um, you know, from the perspective of an export promotion agency uh, in a producing country. Can you really elaborate on the role that sustainability and these standards have played in the promotion of exports uh, from Ghana and the development of Ghanaian enterprise? Over to you, Afwa. Thank you. And once again, good afternoon. I bring you greetings from Ghana, Ghana Export Promotion Authority. And um, I'm so happy that I'm here because of um, the collaboration that we have with International Trade Center, ITC. I must learn to use the um, acronyms. So because of the collaboration we have with ITC, we are here to be a part of this panel discussion. About um, three years ago, we were approached by ITC to collaborate with them on the T4SD, which is now Green to Compete. And um, we were very, very excited about it, listening to what it was all about, about sustainability and how to keep the environment, how to keep the, the SMS, uh, SMEs, how to keep their businesses going and all of that. At the end of it all, it was going to be good for their businesses, what they were going to learn from the VSS, which is now the Voluntary Sustainability Standards, the VSS, what they were going to gain out of it to grow their businesses, um, as well as grow the country. Really, they help with the capacity um, to understand what the VSS is about. We were put through a whole lot of um, um, training 
So we had to select some of the SMEs to be put through this training. And we were supporting the T4S team, which was made up of ITC and GEPA to put the SMEs through all of these standards and um, other green practices that will be good for their organization. In all, 15 SMEs across all sectors talk about the garment um, sector, agribusiness, um, cosmetics, the pharmaceuticals. We put all of them through this training and um, to get certificates like the organic global gap fair trade, you name it, all of those um, certifications, they, they were put through a very stringent training to build their capacity to be able to access these certifications. And six SMEs, um, six of the SMEs are still going through the process to, to get the certification. While four got um, VSS certificates with, um, one getting an organic certificate to be able to sell her products on the international market. And she has been able to um, enter the European market, accessing that European market and getting orders for what she even produces. That is a company that is called Amati, which is um, a company that produces Fonio. Fonio is a, is a, is a very good cereal um, is an ancient cereal from Africa, and I bet to say that it is better than quinoa. So this is another advert for Funio. So, you know, it was a, a great learning curve for, for us as GEPA, as a, as a trade promotion organization, as well as for our entrepreneurs that we were working with, um, because this is another opportunity for us to, to be able to um, get markets for our, our, our exporters who are clients on the international market. So we were learning a lot as well as preparing them as well to take advantage of what was happening. I mean, it's, it's about time and we cannot wait. Whether we like it or not, this is what the world is moving to. We have to be sustainable and we have to help our exporters to get there. And we need to also push our governments to let them know that this is what we have to do. We cannot be, be waiting any longer. It's happening everywhere. And for me, as um, uh, a leader of such an organization, I do a lot of collaboration with my other counterparts in other agencies to see how we can move this forward as fast as we can. And so I link up with Ghana Standards Authority, the Food and Drugs Authority, um, the Agric Ministry, there's a directorate at the Agric Ministry that we work very closely with because of agribusiness. These are the organizations that see to our standards and, and we need to harmonize some of these standards across all sectors because sometimes you have to move from one agency to the other. It's so difficult getting your certificate from one agency to the other sometimes they are basically almost the same certificate. So there's also this um, advocacy for harmonization of all these standards across um, the various agencies. And we are working with them. As I, I talked to you, we have what we call the impact hub situated in GEPA, where we have the, uh, an officer from the Ghana Standards Authority in our premises, an officer from Food and Drugs Authority in our premises, as well as the Ministry of Agri. We have decks for them. And so we work closely together. These are some of the collaborations that are helping us attain the kind of sustainability environment that we want to create in the country. And it's starting from us. And we hope that we can um, rep replicate it across all the sections. But while we were doing this program, we realized that financing for the VSS is quite, um, um, expensive for our clients. So we, we thought that we could help some of them and we have done that. We've, we've helped a few of them, but the next um, level is to take 10 exporters and, and, and support them throughout the whole 
um, um, program to attain what and finance them as well to attain the certifications that they needed. We also are working with the banks. And so at our impact hub, we bring um, officials of the various banks and we are advising them to create products that can help um, these, these um, exporters who want to attain a certain level of, you know, um, certification to be able to break into the international market. We bring the banks on board, they come and talk to them. We are working with them to create products to help them to that um, to get to that level. So these are some of the things that we're doing as a TPO in, 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 in promoting what we want our exporters to achieve, yes. Thanks for that. Um perspective and and I think there's a lot of lessons for other governments and agencies to be drawn from that I mean a few things that come to mind you know it's 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 one thing to sort of say these are the market requirements but actually accompanying that with technical training to help business actually implement that is so critical uh, and I know the work of ITC being really valuable in that regard um, the other aspect which I thought was interesting is trying to bring together the government policies to harmonize them mm -hmm. as well, because, you know, there is also a concern that, you know, th that we'll have one standard for exporters and a different standards exactly. for domestic producers. Mm -hmm. But actually, you know, we have an expression in English that's, you know, a rising tide lifts all the boats, right? Mm -hmm. and, and this is a case where if, if the government helps to coordinate their domestic standards, even for domestic producers, mm -hmm. that's going to help everybody. That will mm -hmm. help the SMEs integrate into global value chains. It'll help with export promotion, but it'll also help the domestic market, hopefully. The last point, which comes up time and time again, is finance. Um, you know, it's one thing to sort of, for a brand to sort of impose standards that they run up the, the supply chain. Um, but, you know, if, if, if on the one hand, requirements on environmental social performance are raising, while on the other hand, absolute product costs are not keeping mm -hmm. pace with inflation and with the and actually going down, mm -hmm. someone's getting pinched in the middle. And often yeah. it's the producer that's struggling to, in the one hand to meet increasing environmental social standards while getting priced out uh, in, in negotiations. And so there's really a role, I think, also for governments to think through access to finance, through financial inclusion, through banking mm -hmm. uh, products, and also international donors through loan guarantee, et cetera, mm -hmm. programs that allows to producers to access yes. finance, particularly when they're pegged against environmental social performance. So we've seen other models where as an, a producer improves against certain metrics, they actually get cheaper rates of finance. So that helps to offset the costs and brings them liquidity to invest in improvement. Now, Janet, I'm going to turn to you. Um, you have the, the, the honor of representing industry here, the industry perspective. Um, you know, we have this weird interplay of private sector standards, public policy, and, you know, originally, you know, never the twain shall meet, but now they're coming together. In trade policy, they're coming together in market regulation on supply chains, for example, in Europe, they're coming together at the producing level. Um, can you walk us through what the brands and companies as part of the Social Asia Convergence Project, which the name almost, I think, speaks for itself, how they speak, see this landscape of competing standards and the challenges and what you're doing to sort of address some of that? Yeah, thank you, Tyler. Happy to do that. Um, to first uh, sketch the, the context, uh, we, we come yesterday from uh, a full day of uh, T4SC forum where there was re-emphasized that it really needed to work on resilience and sustainability in supply chains. And I think it's more urgent than ever. And the case that I want to make here is that I think only through collaborative effort, this can be done and that's the next level. And I was just want to say, put that in the, uh, the through that lens, look at um, and walk you through a practical example of the, how social and labor convergence program has worked on that with all the stakeholders. Yes, with the private sector, maybe first driving this, but right now we, we, we felt that it can only be, be done collectively with all, also um, public uh, players, civil society, um, audit firms, just like, for instance, the manufacturers and the brands. 
Um, so we, we come from um, the, in, particularly in the textile and uh, garment sector, where most of the stakeholders in the social labor convergence program are uh, represented. We come from a place of 25 years of proliferation of social standards and audits. And I think in the, the 300 um, uh, schemes that are, have been mentioned in the sustainability map, a good chunk of those will be applicable, particularly to, uh, to this sector. And so the current situation is that manufacturers, as you already mentioned, are being audited 12 to 15 times a year with almost the same audit, the almost but slightly different. So every time they need to spend resources to um, cater for an, an auditor coming on their site or get walk through a, a certification. And yet these outcomes are not shareable, not comparable. And the, the bigger realization also here is that even despite the 25 years of uh, social audits, if you look at the, the labor conditions, in many cases, they're still not meeting the basic standards. So in the sector that uh, phase three that you earlier mentioned about self-reflection, we, we as, a, as an industry, we as a stakeholder group started uh, that process of self-reflection. And we're thinking about, well, what should we do to um, move from auditing towards improvement? How can we uh, work together to create one um, framework to measure the labor conditions? And also um, that way redeploy resources to where actually they should be spent, which is in the improvement of the labor conditions. Um, so that was the, um, the, the whole rationale behind uh, SLCP. And the other one uh, coming with that is also uniforming the way how uh, you measure and how you assess labor conditions. And that comes with so many additional benefits uh, apart from freeing up resources to be de redeployed. Um, if I just make the parallel with finance uh, reporting. So finance reporting, we all understand globally business. You do that in a certain way, there are rules for it. Everyone accepts that. So why not for measuring social and labor conditions? And if we do that, if we have a uniform of way of um, measuring, collecting data, verifying data, we all can share that. And we, go, we all benefit in, in terms of analyzing the data and having the same common language on acting also upon it. So that state of self-reflection five years ago resulted in um, what is today the social labor convergence uh, program. More than 200 um, signatories who have committed to this mission of uh, first creating, now implementing that converged assessment framework. It took us two and a half years with the brands um, and there are big names uh, among them. Uh, you can look it up yourself, but it's we're talking about the H&Ms and the Nikes of this world, but also smaller brands. We're talking about the SQLs and the Arvins and the TALs of this world, but also smaller manufacturers. And we're talking about all the other stakeholders. Uh, obviously, there is a lot of stakes in it. So it wasn't an easy job. And everyone had to say, give in something, but all for the bigger uh, good of what I was just uh, sketching, convergence with the idea of moving from audits towards actual improvement on the ground. Um, so after having gone through this process, uh, we are now with more than 200 signatories implementing since mid 2019. And say in that uh, the, the new landscape that we have in front of us, not only about so seeing the need to work on sustainability in supply chains, but also um, the, I think the progressing vision on the roles of different players, not only the private sector to uh, work on compliance on social issues, but also having governments um, uh, a clear role for them. And the access of the data should not only be, uh, be for the, the private sector, but also for governments. Imagine if there would be unified uh, data that also can drive um, informed decisions by policymakers at governments. So with that vision, we're implementing since, uh, what is it, a, a bit more than uh, two years now. 
And I have to say the momentum is, is gaining and we are right now um, working with 4,000 factories. We will complete 4,000 uh, assessments this year alone. We're expecting to double that next year. So that will already free up millions of US dollars a year that can be reallocated. More than 50 brands and standard holders have publicly committed to leave apart their proprietary tools and to work with the Convert assessment framework. Um, so with that foresight of uh, scale, we have a huge vision on, on the impact that we can uh, make. I think one of the key um, prospects also of SLCP, it's not another social standard, it's a data-driven um, way of looking at it, a neutral assessment. And we work together with our part, partner ITC also on uh, a way to share those data in a secure and scalable way. Um, so to conclude, conclude on um, how we as a program have uh, built um, and working towards resilience and sustainability in supply chains and how that helps SMEs. I think one, um, we uh, feel we can contribute to SMEs, uh, producers in general, having a share, a fairer share of the pie by reducing resources on audits and having also them um, ownership uh, and understanding of their own data. Um, secondly, so the, the way how we work towards credible and actionable data will help all the stakeholders to um, the supply chain actors to perform human rights due diligence and, and make informed decisions. And, and thirdly, what I was already just mentioning, the big foresight if we go to scale and have uniform data sets. Um, and with the foresight of scaled adoption and all the, the lights are on green here, um, we will have an opportunity to drive data insights at an aggregated level and do data analysis that will um, drive collaborative action and to really pinpoint to what are the best strategies to remediate, to do capacity building, but also for policymakers at governments to drive effective legislation. Thanks a lot. And I, I, you know, I think there's probably a, a challenge in a, in, in a way, sometimes a tension there between on the one hand, making these standards fit for purpose that allow business and manufacturers to prioritize the issues that are most material to them um, and focus on those that are most harmful and adapted to national characteristics while having at, the, at a global level, common metrics that we can measure, you know, and I think sometimes that's a real challenge. I think struggle. Um, do you think, are there some you know, lessons and success factors that will, that can be translated to also other sectors and other supply chains um, that maybe we could take away? Um, yeah, I, I, I would say so. I, I really think this collaborative uh, approach is gonna be the, the next normal and how to make them successful. I, I think really at the heart is, is collaboration and co-creation and where, um, I, I want to stress that, and it sounds like a bit um, maybe woolly, but if we are really wanting to do this in a way that it works best for the um, um, for, for the global good, it, it means that we need to work together as, as equal partners and ensuring in this perspective also that manufacturers um, have their needs and views heard. We've seen in the past that there was often a top-down uh, approach. I think we need to try to leave that aside. The, the, the preconditions for a successful convergence in, um, in textile and garments, but also we are working right now in other sectors. So I think that's also a lesson learned for other sectors is about credibility and, and scale. Mm -hmm. So it, with the credibility, um, you need to work with a corporate, comprehensive, robust, trustworthy data. So it needs to be the right data, needs to be accurate. So we prioritize um, data integrity in everything uh, we do, no compromise on, on quality. It needs to be used for the stakeholders, the business, but also policymakers. So for instance, when we developed the Converge Assessment Framework, we, need, we made sure that it was in line with the OECD due diligence guidance. The second one on scale, just a couple of, I, I can speak for, long for on that <laughs> one, but maybe just a, a glimpse of that. Um, so it, 
the ability to drive a system with with large numbers it needs a strong technology uh, infrastructure um, technology sharing data is going to be the the new next um, uh, demand and we're we're working with uh, as i mentioned already itc's gateway to secure that um, it's shared in uh, in a safe and a and a scalable way but it's also about the accessibility um, of the tool so the, the uh, capacity to use the the CAF, the converged assessment framework across the region, capacity to uh, capacity building and availability of training and support for SMEs uh, worldwide, and yes, there is maybe a bit of a challenge, as you said, in trying to find metrics that are globally applicable, um, while addressing the needs at um, uh, also at the local uh, level, but if you take global frameworks as the starting point, uh, for instance, OECD due diligence guidance, but also the, o the ILO conventions, I think you cover 90% uh, of that. We work mm -hmm. with, uh, in our partnership, for instance, with, uh, with Better Work, we're working on in, uh, in specific countries to, to fine tune it with local requirements and that are aligned with the um, the constituents, local government, local uh, employers and employees uh, representatives. Um, but there is a good chunk that is globally uh, uh, applicable. So I take away, first of all, the need for, you know, that platform for convening and collaboration. Um, you know, we can't underestimate how important that is. Uh, that alignment with the global benchmarks, I think, which are reflect global best practice, but then the ad adaptation to a local level, which is that 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 challenge, but is really critical to get local buy-in, and then bringing it to scale um, and using the technology, I think, is, is a good example of that. Look, we have 15 minutes left. Um, I did want to open it up for questions from the audience. I can I can also have other questions that I can pose to you all. Uh, but first, is if there's questions from the audience, and I do see a couple coming in, so. I'll read them out um, uh, for the panelists and, the, and the, the participants here in person. And then I'll uh, I'll take maybe two, two from the room. I see one here and one here. I'll read these out and then we'll go back to the panel, all right? So first of all, there, there was a question about, does collective action and the use of sustainability standards apply to investors or can it extend to investors? Uh, the participant recognized that uh, the Stanford so Social Innovation Review is encouraging investors to, to engage with their companies and advocacy around making impact and are vo voluntary sustainability standards part of the solution and how can they leverage it? Then there's another question about, do these standards have a role in promoting trade of environmental goods in a way that supports developing country priorities? Um, so I think an important one, and I think we've all touched on that to a certain extent, but maybe panelists can dig in. Um, and then I'll take two questions here and then we'll turn back. So please, you go ahead first. And please introduce yourself. If you say it out loud, I'll repeat it. Thank you very much. So uh, the question, just to repeat for our online uh, benefit of the viewers, is um, from the uh, gentleman from the Dutch Farmers Association and wondering to the extent that competition law, to summarize, does it have a chilling effect on uh, sustainability standards and what, how should policy be adapted in a way to foster better collaboration amongst competing companies? And is transparency the answer? Um, so very good and technical question. I'm happy to take a stab. 
uh, at that in a moment. But first, I'll take the last question before turning back to the panel. Please, back there. I can't hear you. Yeah. Okay, um, so we have the question on investors. We have the question on um, how can environmental uh, goods help support developing countries and these standards. And we have great some specific questions on competition law uh, as well as to SLT. Maybe I'll start with you because we have a real specific one on the financing. And then if any of you want to take the other's flag, maybe I'll go around. Thanks. Yeah, so um, SLCP was um in at the start of it so in when i was speaking about that reflection uh, phase five years ago was funded by um a, a combination 50 percent uh, industry and 50 percent of uh, a charity uh, fund after that we got some um some funding from um the uh, the dutch government but also, and that maybe links to one of the other questions about investors, it was also one of the biggest investors in the textile and apparel sector. They also were funding this with the eye, uh, with the view of data, credible data, um, is not only, say, fulfilling the purpose of compliance mechanisms or uh, in a sustainability uh, policy of brands or manufacturers, but also investors. That's an interesting model. Um, after that, that phase when we were building the tools, uh, we had funding from our signatories themselves. And right now we're on, in a model where we are really in the implementation phase and where we're self-sustaining right now for 95%, uh, next year 100% by the implementation of the verification and the use of the, of the data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would just just to add on the investor point that uh, from our perspective, we see you know investors on the one hand really needing these standards because they need them to screen their portfolios and and then ideally engage to actually drive improvement among companies in their, in their standards, but they can also be subject to them. They can be subject to different reporting frameworks and codes of conduct that we see emerging as well. Um, our recommendation to investors is to call on these standards to align with global benchmarks and to work uh, to help with the financing problem. So to sort of live into that financial problem and not just sort of say, here, adopt it, but actually provide solutions to producers all over the world on how to actually finance that. That would be, that would be at least our advice from the OECD angle. Um, Jean-Marie, can I turn to you about the WTO's view around, if there's any thoughts around, you know, is this con contravening competition law? or I can answer that as well, but broadly the, the perspective of the WTO on some of these, these points. Thank you, Tyler. I leave, around, uh, I, I leave out investment and competition because the WTO has no law uh, on that and actually on competition. The irony of it is that we discovered that we had no law with a case which was based about the use of private standards. It was a Fuji Kodak uh, panel uh, 20 years ago and the private behaviors of Japan were deemed anti, competitive, but it was not uh, within our, our, our realm. So we are narrowly trade. I'd just like to, 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 to pick up, but probably Pamela has much more to say about that, on the developing country angle, which is, uh, I, I, uh, we, we all know that when it comes to sustainability, there are a lot of niches where there is natural competitive advantage from developing country, be it an organic product, for instance, or alternative to plastic in packaging. So I would um, encourage um, especially uh, agency working with SMEs to, to, to try to help them converge and help shape those standards, uh, those private standards of market to, to help them 
take advantage of those competitive advantages. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to go down the panel then. Pamela, if I can turn to you on your reflections on how does this help developing countries and what are the challenges there, but also any of the other kind of reflections you have on what you've heard. Um, well, first of all, let me start with the issue of collaboration. I, I think uh, what Afwa uh, pointed out in terms of having uh, key agencies actually sit in GEPA is one of the, 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 the examples of how this kind of collaboration can work at the national level. Because there, there's always uh, too many silos. And because standards bodies don't talk to agriculture and agriculture doesn't talk to export and export doesn't talk to investment, we end up with not having a coherent national policy and thereby not being able to, to take advantage of, of the voluntary sustainability standards and what it can mean in terms of entering niche markets. On the issue of developing countries, there's no question, um, as, as Jean-Marie uh, said, that there is a key advantage that many developing countries will have, particularly in the area of organic produce and so on. But it's going to be important to give the technical assistance to these SMEs, simply because capacity-wise, we, we recognize that it's a challenge, um, that financing is always a challenge, that enabling them to actually access new markets using these uh, voluntary sustainability standards is also important. Um, and so the other issue that we need to recognize is that from what I've heard, and I think it's clear that VSS is here to stay. I mean, it may it may change a little bit, you know, as it does over the years, but the point is that it's not going away. And so it is also important that as it gets more embedded in national policies, in international um, agreements, that the adjustments and the technical assistance that is provided becomes also more embedded, because without that, we, we will leave a lot behind and we can't afford to have that happen. Um, I think also, and I think you can speak more to this, the issue of due diligence frameworks. Um, the truth is that those also are going to, to add to the mix. Um, and so everybody wants to implement these highly aspirational policies, but at the end of the day, it comes down to the capacity and the ability to, to engage. Um, so once again, we go back to the issue of ensuring that uh, developing countries and SMEs in developing countries are given the, the space and the uh, technical um, help to do this. Um, so finally, I, I'd say that, you know, we have to together equip them to become more resilient um, because at the end of the day, resilience is what is going to enable them to be competitive and also to survive. Um, and part of this is enabling them to meet these standards, to understand them and to engage in the market um, at the level. One of the things I've always said is that we're very good as developing countries, because I was one of them, in negotiating agreements. We're brilliant. You know, we, we, we're good at commas and processes and making sure the agreement looks good. What we do with them after continues to be the problem. And so part of that is the, the linkage between agreements and policy and actual implementation at the business level. And that's where we come in, translating what we have and what we say and what the policies are to the business. How does the business, you know, make this work? And so we work with GEPA and other uh, organizations to, to make this happen. So I'll just stop there. Thanks. Thanks for those uh, reflections. And, um, you know, I think if there's one, one takeaway from this is, you know, voluntary sustainability standards are, are here to stay but they may not be voluntary in the future. Uh, and I think that's certainly where we're going. Um, Afwa, can I ask you, I mean, from your perspective, any reflections on what you have heard? Um, there's also, and I think Pamela, you also touched on at this point about, you know, is it the lack of legislation or the lack of the challenge with enforcing legislation, which is the problem here? I don't know if you have any perspectives on that question or also the question about collaboration. Your mic, please, thanks. As you just said, um, VSS is here to stay. And we at GEPA has actually made it a part of our service um, um, processes. And so it's going to, you know, it's, it's here to stay with us. We are going to integrate it into our processes and make sure that um, 
we, we build the capacity of our exporters to take advantage of it because to become competitive, now you need all those standards um, to be in place. And as we are working together and collaborating with others, it will not be just collaborating with agencies in Ghana, but collaborating with agencies uh, within West Africa, ECOWAS for now, as we have a TPO, we have um, an ECOWAS TPO network that we, we, we formed recently and we talk amongst ourselves. And so I think that it shouldn't just stop at Ghana for me, I'm going to talk to the rest of my colleagues in the ECOWAS network, and we should all get together to make this work. If it works, we are escalating it to AFCFTA. And so we have to start from somewhere, but I have already started from my country, and I know that we are going to succeed because I can see the enthusiasm of um, my other colleagues and in, in, in working with me on this. And we will be the advocates to make sure that government looks at it seriously. Thank you very much for those sharing those words. Um, and a couple of points from my side on the competition question. Um, first of all, I know there are a number of countries now that are reconsidering their competition to grant an exemption to allow competing companies to collaborate and share information regarding sustainability objectives. Um, but at the same time, there's particular caution that companies need to pay to sharing price information and specific supplier details. Um, now, Countries like South Africa, Australia actually have a specific carve out for sustainability objectives. EU is considering to revise its objectives, um, its competition law and to allow for that public, ex public uh, good exemption. Um, but I would say that 90% of the collaboration that businesses can do on sustainability is not a competitive issue. That's the main, that's the main response is that when you're talking about what standards are important and good practice and how this can be implemented in the supply chain and how do we collaborate, that's really pre-competitive. When you start talking about price information, um, which by the way is part of the challenge, you know, financing that improvement requires talking about price sometimes. That's where you may want to petition your competition authority to ask them for an opinion in advance before proceeding. Um, so, but the main message is most of collaboration is pre-competitive. Um, and I would say that there's a lot to say about that. And you can look online um, as well at the OECD's website, Google competition law and responsible business conduct. And you'll find an analysis of, of this issue uh, if, if you'd like some more. Um, with that, um, and there was another question, I'm sorry, we, we didn't really get to the nut of your question about, is it about legislation, lack of legislation or enforcement? Um, if I had to say my view, I'd probably a little bit of both. Um, there is a, without a doubt, a, a governance gap in, in, in you know, consuming countries around what is happening in supply chains and who is responsible for that. There is a lack of ability of those that are harmed by business activity and supply chains to access remedies. So there is a need for new legislation that takes into account best practice and global developments. At the same time, no doubt, it's all about enforcement of existing laws. If that were effectively enforced, we wouldn't have many of the challenges we had to have today. So really, I think it's not either or, but really both. Addressing where there is that gap in accountability currently, but also really keeping our eye on the prize to enforce environmental and labor law uh, all over the world and kind of in a way that's you know, effective. With that, um, to my panelists, I wanna thank you all. Um, it will be impossible for me to summarize all the rich uh, discussions. Clearly voluntary sustainability standards are here to stay. They may not be voluntary. We need to align with global benchmarks. You know, We need to ensure that there's technical capacity building and financing for their implementation. And we need to think about this interaction between public policy and private standards and strengthen the connecting tissue between those actors, but also within governments, between trade, between environment, between you know, financial market regulators, et cetera. So that would be my takeaway. And I would like to first thank you all here that are in, in person. It's great to see some people in person. Thank you all online. We weren't able to get all of the questions because one or two came through at the last moment, but apologies for that. Um, and enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you.